So I'm going to talk to you about a few of the things that are going on in my lab. I'll anchor the talk in, in the title, which is about um, anti-HIV neutralizing antibodies and how autoreactivity doesn't seem to be decisive in preventing broad responses in people. Um, and then if there's enough time, there's a couple of other projects that I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about that's, that are going on in my, in my laboratory in Cape Town. Um, so just, I, I thought I would start this maybe uh, a bit too basic, but I ask one of the more basic questions and try to take a step back. Um, and is an antibody-based vaccine actually a, a good target? Um, antibodies protect naturally infected people at most temporarily. It's a matter of uh, disagreement in the field to what extent or even if they actually protect naturally infected people. That could be another discussion for another point. I'd be happy to pick that up with anybody who's interested. Um, and with in-person HIV, diversity is very high. As I'll show you a little bit, um, by the time neutralizing antibody responses come up in people, the diversity is high enough that actually there was almost certainly neutralization resistant viruses that are already present in the person, in the swarm, even before the antibody appears. Um, and just to give you an idea, the within person HIV diversity, the diversity of HIV in one single chronically infected individual is approximately equivalent to the entire diversity of the worldwide influenza uh, epidemic of a particular year. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of diversity there, and that's actually one of the more fundamental problems. So, so why, why is it that we think an antibody-based vaccine might be a good target? And in fact, some of the things I'm going to say probably, probably also would apply to T-cell-based vaccines. But I work with antibodies, so I'm going to center it there. And what really is the rationale to try and understand these neutralizing antibody responses or the non-neutralizing antibody responses um, in order to make a vaccine? In order to go to that, I'm going to take also a, a bit of a step back and just give you what, what, what actually turns out to be a key piece of data in the rationale, in the idea that we really think we could make an HIV, an antibody-based HIV vaccine. At least it might be possible. And that's about 75 to 80% of, of infections that, at least that arise from heterosexual contact. Homosexual contact, it's a little bit lower, but still substantial. But most infections actually arise from a single virus that disseminates in the new host. And most of the other infections at the balance are only a few viruses. And there's a few papers, um, actually, let me just, what happened to my laser pointer? There it is. Sorry. So there's a few papers that, uh, that, that have made this point quite well in a couple of different settings, one in South Africa and two, two in the United States that show this quite well. Um, and that has substantial implications for vaccine development. What that actually means, so let, let, let's take the natural infection case first. So antibodies come up somewhere in the range of about three months. Why it takes so long to see neutralizing antibodies? Most antibody responses are faster. But neutralizing antibodies generally take three months um, and sometimes a bit longer. The range seems to be about three to 12 months. We could probably pull that back a little bit if we were a little more sensitive in measuring them. Um, but the idea is, is that by the time this antibody appears, as I've said, there's almost certainly already resistant, neutralization resistant viruses present in the swarm. Um, but for a vaccine, we have actually potentially the opposite kind of scenario where the antibody predates the infection and the infection is very frequently one virus that actually is capable of disseminating. So with a, pre, with a pre existing antibody or vaccine antibody, the virus might really be neutralized before infection is established. And you wouldn't have to, in an individual, deal with the same level of diversity. Of course, you'd want as high a coverage as possible. You'd want to cover as many of these events as possible. But you could imagine protective events 
from an antibody-based vaccine, even if the coverage was less than 100%, which it certainly would be for an antibody-based vaccine. And it's based on this sort of rationale that we think it's actually a worthwhile endeavor to study antibody responses with an eye towards trying to figure out how to make a vaccine. So that's what I'm going to continue with today. If that's, um. So we would want to base our vaccine on these sort of broadly neutralizing, in these vulnerable sites to which broadly neutralizing antibodies are possible. And that's one of the prominent methods that's being made to model an immunogen. And I'll come back to why we've come to this. Um, and the simple answer is, is that the traditional modes of making vaccines don't haven't, haven't really given us the kind of vaccine we'd like that protect people in any substantial way. So we've come to these sorts of mo methods of identifying the sites. This, this idea has certainly been around for a while, although it's picked up, uh, technically picked up a lot of steam with the identification of new sites over the past five years. So in rare HIV-infected person, antibodies arise. They can neutralize many strains of HIV from many subtypes. And a substantial amount of effort in the field has been devoted to understanding who these sites are and now how these antibodies come about and why they take so long to come about and what, in principle, we could do with a vaccine um, to try to recapitulate this. And that's at least the idea. It's probably more, more difficult than just saying it, but these antibodies may guide us as to how to make a vaccine and who good immunogens are. And I'll just take kind of a, a moment out just to give you a, at least a little bit of the sense of the diversity. There are many different subtypes. Um, there are nine that are well identified that have disseminated. Uh, most of them have disseminated out of Central Africa, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, and this just gives you a sense of the proportions. There are also circulating recombinant forms that get a number and then are given their their putative parents in their name as well, as well as their serial number. Um, and this is important here because I'm going to use some of these viruses to work with the sera, and I'll tell you about that. So just, just to sort of give you a sense of sort of the, the gross diversity, as it were. There are several targets identified. Um, in fact, this is from 2012, there's been one or possibly two, depending on how you want to count, that have been identified since this picture was made. I'm going to map a lot of sera for whether or not they have antibodies or dominant antibodies, depending on which site, to any of these. And then, uh, so I'm only going to choose the ones that we can map very well then, and in large scale. So I'm going to pick up here towards the top, it's sometimes called the V2 apex site, because it's at the top, as it were, of the viral envelope. This is the V2 glycans. Um, there's not really quite a standard naming. I'm going to call this the V2 glycan site because most of the epitope is actually protein and only a minor part of the epitope and its structure actually comes from the glycan. So I'll call it sort of the V2 glycan site. Um, there's two of them over here, one of which is rarely recognized. And I measure them together because the this is the recognition of a glycans primarily in the V3 loop um, because I'll, in principle, at least pick up antibodies from either of these sites with the mutants that I use. And then the third one that we look at is the membrane proximal external region. It's right at the membrane. It's the only one of these sites that's found in GP41. And its antibodies are kind of interesting and they probably work a little differently um, they probably lock envelope into conformations that prevent fusion and prevent the virus from fusing with a target cell rather than preventing the initial attachment, which is plausibly what happens with a lot of these other sites up here. But these three are chosen because we could actually map large numbers of sera for whether or not they have antibodies to these sites. So just, just to just kind of frame your mind of what the problem's about, and I've alluded to this a bit, is that the current approaches really haven't worked. And the vaccine also, unlike most vaccines, would have to induce, in some fundamental sense, a better response than people make to natural infection. And so that, that makes this particularly difficult. Um, 
getting sort of to the nitty gritty ends of what the, some of the problems are, is many anti HIV broadly neutralizing antibodies are autoreactive or polyreactive, and I'll define those terms in the next slide. The first thought about this was about anti imper antibodies, was in science paper about 10 years ago. Um, and auto, this autoreactivity and polyreactivity are thought to pose both direct and indirect barriers to the development of breath. And that's why we initiated the studies that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time about. But first, let me just spend a moment or two just kind of defining those terms. Sorry, this may take a moment to get to the next slide. Um, so I'll just explain a little bit. Autoreactivity is, or frank autoreactivity, is when an antibody actually cross-reacts very strongly with a self-protein. And polyreactivity is something that's also seen in autoimmune disease in which you have an antibody that actually binds to a large number of proteins and surfaces, but each one to each one very weakly. So this is a very recent study that, that actually shows this up very well, and so I've taken this as, as kind of a good way of, of explaining this. So they assessed a number of anti imper anti-V2 glycan site and anti-V3 glycan antibodies. Those are the three sites I'm going to work with. These are all monoclonals. And what they had is they had an array of human proteins that were expressed in yeast, and they measured the responsiveness to our candidate, um, our, our test antibody, and the control antibody. They had a set of controls up in this box just to make sure that they had added equivalent amounts of active antibody. And what they were able to do here is then assessed, sort of like in a, in, a, in a protein array, how well each antibody, their control antibody and their test antibody, bound to each of these proteins. So each of these proteins is a dot that's spotted twice on the array for, in different places for control purposes. And you can see that some of these proteins are actually bound very well, but this display allows you to take that out with your eye. Um, and you can see some autoreactivity. So two of the anti imper antibodies, they've actually used this to identify an autoantigen, which, um, which they then subsequently confirmed with ELISA. But they also kind of saw what people had thought before, but much, much more systematically, that you can see what we'll call polyreactivity, a bit of a bulge, that there's a lot of proteins that are recognized by the test protein better than by the by, by test antibody, better than by the control antibody. And there's a lot of reason to think, and there's a lot of ink been spilled over this over the past 10 years, to think that this will interfere with making these, the development of these responses and making them broad, broad through affinity maturation. And that's something I'm going to come back to. So what's been known is that you see a lot of either autoreactivity, polyreactivity of anti imper antibodies. And this study tested three anti-V3 glycan antibodies and found two of them to be polyreactive. And so these, these sites, and that may not be very surprising, it's probably a limited number of structures you can get out of glycans. And although I don't think the authors tested it, it's very possible that a lot of the dots that are in here in this polyreactive section, as it were, actually are there because they have glycans that sort of fold at least a little bit like the glycans that these antibodies are recognizing. So now with that introduction, I'd like to, and, and kind of setting this in context, I'd like to tell you about what we've been doing. We had a, a set of sera from chronically HIV infected individuals, the antiretroviral naive, uh, because that interferes with the antibody responses as antigen levels go down. And um, we mapped these sera for anti imper antibodies, that was the one in the GP41, and dominant anti V2 glycan site or dominant anti V2 glycan antibodies, and tried to use this comparison to the breadth and potency to assess the contribution in a large set of each site to the breadth and potency that you actually get out of a cohort of individuals who might reasonably be a model for vaccinees, for example. And this hasn't been done. What people have done is they've taken the most broadly neutralizing sera and then tried to pick out if there was a single antibody responsible for that, which in the very most broadly neutralizing sera is true, and use that to identify these sites in the first place. So, so we, we depend on that information, but, but this actually, in an important sense, is different. It's trying to ask, is, is, it, is there really an impediment 
to making broad antibodies to this site. And since we can't do that with vaccinees, we do it with naturally infected people. So we have 177 chronically HIV infected individuals. They're all infected more than a year. That's how we define them as chronic. They're antiretroviral naive, so that we should be looking at essentially the native immune response without manipulating it. Although we had to exclude uh, prevention of mother to child transmission that was for a very short duration and at least three months prior. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to recruit in South Africa. We had two locations, the caregivers of children. So we wanted people who at least grossly were reasonably well in uh, Khrotiskir Hospital, which is a tertiary hospital actually just up the hill from ICGEB. And we also co uh, collected samples from people who are coming for their CD4 counts and just for their check of wellness in a primary clinic in uh, in Kailicha Site B, which is where uh, um, where, where we can find, unfortunately, a lot of HIV-infected individuals. Um, we took a virus panel. It was diverse by subtype. Uh, although I don't show it here, we tried also within subtypes to diversify by location where the sample was collected from, from which this virus came. We, I won't explain this very much, but uh, the tier, tier viruses have been assigned tiers one, two, or three, with three being the most intrinsically neutralization resistant. And we ex deliberately excluded tier one viruses that were assigned that by one of the more systematic studies that's been published. And we also tended to exclude the viruses that were very neutralization sensitive to our sera just because they didn't tell us as much. This is their sort of geometric mean neutralization. So this is a geometric mean ID50. So the all 177 sera neutralizing that particular <laughs> virus you, we calculate the approximate dilution at which the serum neutralizes 50% of the virus in vitro. So overall, we tend to get relatively low values here. In fact, 10 is the value we, we assigned as, as resistant. And below about 40 or 50, it starts getting very hard to measure. Um, so just to give you an idea of the distribution of their neutralization breadth or potency, so this is the number of panel viruses neutralized at ID50 greater than 100. And then we also took a geometric mean ID50 sort of 90 degrees off and basically asked what was the geometric mean ID50 of that serum neutralizing all 24 of our panel viruses. And we took partially arbitrary cutoffs, but our cutoffs tended to be a bit severe where generally in the range of about one in six viruses become broad. Most of our analysis doesn't use this cutoff, but one, one analysis does categorize by this cutoff. So I'll show it to you here. When we detected our anti imper antibodies, we actually used a technique that's been developed by others and is available in the field, is you start with an HIV-2 virus and basically by mutagenesis sort of essentially splice in the amino acids of an HIV-1 imper. We used three different impers, two of which were in the constructs we received from colleagues, and the third of which we made by mutagenesis from one of the others. And the point for that was to try to capture as much of the antibody as possible, regardless of its specificity. Uh, this has an exposed, relatively easy to neutralize emper, and then you compare the neutralization between this chimeric virus and the parent HIV2 virus, and the difference is actually presumably antibodies to, to this emper, and that seems to work pretty well and measure up with other harder to multiplex measures of emper. So that's, that's this site over here. That's the one at the base, and it's the one that's in GP41. Looking for the, ant the other sites, we used a mutational approach where you essentially take a parent virus and you mutate the key sites that are part of the epitope. Here, two asparagines that are in the V3 loop. In structure, in structures, they're right next to each other. And we just mutated the asparagines to alanines. Um, we picked three viruses. It's the same parent viruses for others. Again, to try to get as much kind of epitope diversity and antibody recognition diversity within the epitope as we could. And one of them, we only mutated the N301 because it didn't have an asparagine at position 332. And, um, sorry, I thought I'd shut off the sound there. Um, for the anti V2 glycan site, we picked positions uh, 160 and 169. 
and uh, 160 is in asparagine, and that's glycosylated, and that makes part of the site. But its main contribution to the epitope seems to be structural rather than direct antibody binding. Um, and then also this K, uh, uh, lysine or isoleucine at 169 is a key part of the site as well. And then to give you a bit of an idea of what, the, what our data looked like, so this is just fold drop in ID50 between the parent virus and the mutant. We mutated 160 and 169 separately, just to be, to be quite sure about it. Uh, that we, and that's also, again, most of the mapping text is separately. And we pick threefold as our cutoff. Part of the reason to pick threefold is you can get effects across the molecule. You can get this N160A affecting recognition at other sites. And in most cases, that effect is less than threefold. So pick, we pick this threefold cutoff partly in order to try and filter that out. So ultimately, in aggregate, a hit for either of these sites, and this is the three parent viruses aggregated, and then further aggregating these together, about just under one third of our sera uh, seem to have a dominant antibody recognizing the site to one of our three parent viruses. One thing that was interesting was for the N160, we saw a few sera that were sort of in the opposite direction. So values less than one are increases in neutralization. And what we think that is, is that the glycan at 160 was blocking an antibody. And that is something we expected to happen because we know that these glycans, one of the major functions of these glycans is to block antibody responses. And there are several characterized cases of that in the literature. We then looked at the anti imper levels. We picked 1,000 as our cutoff based on the literature. Antibodies, um, a sera with with values over 1,000 for these constructs, for ID50 over 1,000. That's associated with antibodies that recognize other HIV-1 viruses by recognition of this site, that neutralize them, excuse me, by recognition of this site. Um, and we got gen just about the same proportion. We can't assess all of our sera for, for the V2 and the V3 sites because they, the serum has to actually neutralize one of our three mapping viruses before, before we can see a drop. But again, about, about one in five sera recognized each of these sites. And now to the key piece of data is how does that match up with our neutralization breadth and potency? So we came up with a measure, and part of the reason to display this this way is that we, we calculated an error of measurement for our, for our neutralization, neutralization breadth and potency. And we found that the imper recognizing sera on average recognized about 4.6 more viruses out of 24 than the imper negative sera. And the V3 glycan recognizing sera recognized about three and a quarter more viruses uh, of our panel out of the 24. We did see a slight increase for the V2 glycan site positives, but not very much. And it's kind of hard to understand if this is biologically significant or not. So we get a lot more breadth out of the sera that recognize either the emper or the V3 glycans, and not very much out of the V2 glycan sites. We also looked at a ratio of neutralization potency. The emper positive sera are about twice as potent as the emper negative sera, and realizing that within these emper negative sera that there actually are quite probably seven, the number of sera that recognize other sites, including sites that we didn't assess. And with the V3 glycan site positives, about a 1.7 fold effect and none at all for the V2 glycan sites. And this was a bit of a surprise for us because we pick these sites because we know that very broadly neutralizing antibodies are possible. There are monoclonal antibodies that are very broadly neutralizing that recognize each of these sites. And so for whatever reason, the imper and the V3 glycan positive uh, antibodies were associated with breadth and were presumably therefore making a very large contribution to breadth within the cohort, whereas antibodies that recognized at least this site weren't, weren't really able to do that. We then, just to do sort of a check, we stratified our, uh, uh, divided our antibodies into the ones that were potently or less potently neutralizing based on the cutoffs that I showed you several slides back either 220 for the geometric mean ID50 in potency or 
three quarters of the panel viruses, 18 out of 24 for the neutralization. And what we see is that if you're an imper recognizing Sarah, you're just about twofold as likely to be potently or broadly neutralizing, and that um, nods just above the 0.05 significance level and below it over here. So if you're an imper recognizing antibody, you are more likely to be uh, at least broadly neutralizing. And if we probably if we had a slightly larger sample size, we'd probably see that here. I'm gonna skip down to the anti-V3 glycans. If you're anti-V3 glycan positive, you're a bit over twofold more likely to be both broadly and potently neutralizing, and both of those are statistically significant. Um, for the anti-V2 glycan site, essentially no effect at all. Not more likely to be broadly or potently neutralizing. And that was a bit of a surprise for us. There are people who really are trying to to uh, model this as a site. I mean, this is a significant part of uh, uh, vaccine development research now. Um, so just, just sort of to remind you a bit of the significance. So previous HIV vaccines have um, induced broadly neutralizing, and have not been able to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies or substantially protect vaccinees. That's had people start looking harder at how to make the broadly neutralizing antibodies. It's also, although not a topic of today's talk, had people start looking a lot harder at non-neutralizing antibodies and how they might function. But that's much harder to do in a vaccine. Once you, the antibody doesn't neutralize, and doesn't essentially prevent the virus from, from targeting a cell on its own, you need other parts of the immune system, usually parts of the innate immune system, and we're just not very good at making those work well in vaccines. So that's going to be a, a harder hill to climb, but given some of the difficulties here, people have started looking at that. So as I've said, back to the kind of the significance here, new approaches are being used to design HIV vaccines and that have never been successfully used in any licensed vaccine. Um, so we really don't know how, how easy or hard it could be made to work, and we don't have very good models of making these approaches work. And one of the most prominent ones for antibody-based HIV vaccines are identifying these candidate immunogens and then trying to model them. And one of the hurdles has been this autoreactivity that's thought to pose a lot of barriers, and yet it's exactly those autoreactive, polyreactive antibodies sites, as it were, whose antibodies are associated with breadth in our cohort. And although it's possible that we'd see more breadth, were they not autoreactive or polyreactive, I think this is our kind of key conclusion, is that these effects are actually not decisive in who is able to make broadly neutralizing antibodies and who is actually able to sort of go down that garden path route through affinity maturation, through selection, uh, to make broadly neutralizing antibodies. So we want to kind of keep these in, in our high list. And, um, and it was surprising for us that, uh, in a sense that, that we didn't see it for all of them. We were expecting to compare magnitudes. Um, and we found ourselves comparing something to nothing. So I'm going to just stop here and just move on to a couple of other projects in the lab. Um, and one of them is about the association between CD4 repleteness and viral load and what that tells us immunologically about what's going on in HIV-infected people. So this idea has been around for a while. It's been in the literature. It's pretty clear that CD4 T cell count and, and neutralization capacity, in this case measured the same way, <coughs> in, in the same set of samples I've just shown you, are negatively correlated. On the face of it, immunologically, it's a surprising result uh, because we expect to need CD4 T cells in order to make antibody responses, in order to mature them, and we know that maturation is a key part of neutralization breadth. So this is actually, in a sense, not the result you expect, but everybody who looks for it hard enough sees this in some form, whether this is, in our case, this is the contemporaneous CD4 count from the same sample, you could use CD4 count set point and how it predicts neutralization breadth later. You could look at decline in CD4 count over infection compared to neutralization breadth or potency, um, and, and you'll always find this effect um, in some form or another in every cohort that people have looked in. There's been a lot of ink spilled about it and what it means. And there are a lot of explanations that have kind of percolated through the literature, most of which are pretty much impossible to test. 
Um, but what we think is this is actually an indirect effect, that higher viral load or viral diversity or some parameter that's similar to that is actually needed in order to make broad antibodies. And this parameter is associated with viral load, at least to the extent it's viral load itself, and then that's negatively associated with CD4 count. The higher your viral load, generally speaking, the lower your CD4 count. And we're sort of seeing an indirect effect through some form of viral load or diversity, and we're not quite sure exactly what it is, but it's some form of that and that it's actually an indirect effect. And we actually went to look in children. All of this prior data is all from adults. And we had blood plasma from 31 HIV-infected children from Cameroon, from the CRCB, the institute in Cameroon. They're all antiretroviral naive, a median age of seven years with a range of one and a half to 12 years. We picked the bottom of this because we didn't want to see maternal antibodies. So we picked 18 months as a lower cutoff. Um, we excluded a few samples here. Three of them, we used, uh, let me step back from, we used purified antibody. These samples weren't collected for this purpose, so they were collected with heparin as an anticoagulant, and that interferes with our neutralization assays in vitro. Um, even after we purified, anti them, a, a purified antibody from them, three samples neutralized our negative control virus. We presume because some heparin came along for the ride with some of the antibodies, um, and it's a murine leukemia virus, enveloped virus that we use as a negative control. So we just excluded those samples. We just didn't think we could get data from them. And from one sample, these samples were quite small. We just didn't get enough antibody back when we purified it. So we were left with 27 samples. Um, a bit more about measuring CD4 repleteness rather than CD4 count. Um, CD4 count actually varies with age, completely independent of HIV infection in, small, in children, up to about 5 or 10 years of age. That probably pretty much reflects the filling out of the immune system by thymic export. So there are some better measures to use. I'll show you percent CD4 T cells of lymphocytes. There are also a couple of metrics that are partly based on this percentage, but take account of things like particularly the age. Um, and there's two clinical stages, one from the CDC and one from the World Health Organization. Um, and what we see is the opposite effect. I flipped the numbers around here because this is an IC50. This is the concentration of antibody that neutralizes 50% of the virus. So as you get a lower value, you have more neutralization. That is, in this case, um, neutralization capacity here is positively associated with CD4 T cell count, exactly the opposite of what we see with adults. And no matter how we slice it or whatever metric you use, whether we use the CD4, um, the CD4 immuno, immunocompromised scale or the WHO immunocompromised scale, it always comes up significant and it's always significantly positively associated with being more CD4 T cell replete. The ones who are more immunocompromised have less neutralization and higher mean IC, geometric mean IC50 values and that we published last year. Our explanation, we think is the most likely, although others are possible, is that the CD4 T cells that actually help these responses are actually rarer in children and adults. Whoever you are, whatever makes that CD4 T cell one that in practice will help with breadth, are actually rarer in adults. So it's actually easier for HIV to limit T cell help in children. And what we think is happening in adults is that there are basically so many of these cells around that the HIV mediated depletion actually doesn't matter here. You get enough T cell help within the range of CD4 T cell counts that we have in our studies. And then this other indirect effect predominates. But what seems to be happening in children is that actually we're really having a much bigger effect on their, on their ability to make antibody responses and to mature them. And that has a lot of implications for things like vaccination and health of children. So, and, 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 and also gives us some insight into the dynamic and the interplay between HIV and T cells kind of in, a, in broad strokes and how it is actually different in children than adults. So I'm gonna move on just now quickly to one other project that we've talked about, uh, that, that I'd like to talk about from our lab. Uh, 
Um, it's spearheaded by Marcel Tango, my postdoc, and um, we have Darren Martin at the University of Cape Town as a collaborator for, to help us with some of the computational work. And we'd, what we'd re there, there are nine that I've shown you, and I'll show you again, sort of what we'll call single letter subtypes. They're, 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 they're the ones that are thought to be and presumed to be non-recombinant and have disseminated by being, they've been identified by being disseminated. And we've come up with some evidence that there actually might be a lot more of them. So just to give you sort of a, a by way of introduction, so HIV is thought to have come from non-human primate to human transfers in the Congo Basin, mostly in the south of Cameroon, and spread from there. A lot of the spread seems to have been based upon who made it to uh, the nearby trade town, which, which was, and to some extent still is, Kinshasa. And that's when the explosion of HIVs happened. And that comes up pretty, pretty strongly in some recent models about this. But there is this very old population of HIV that seems to center around primarily southern Cameroon in the Congo Basin. And HIV, as I've said, is actually very, very diverse. But now I want to look at this at a slightly different level than the within-person diversity and in the sort of world diversity, the global diversity. There are high viral replication and error rates. There can be prolonged courses of infection. HIV diversifies foreign infection. That's only a small part of what's sort of going on in the overall global population. And there's viral adaptation to immune responses and also now to drug pressures. And also, very importantly, genomic, genomic recombination is actually very, very common. You really only just, if you have two viruses in the same cell, recombination appears to happen at a, at a relatively high rate, and a rate high enough that we see very, very large numbers of recombinants when we, when we look for them sort of in, in sequences. So there's a lot of divergent strains, and there's also, as I say, a lot of recombination. And that actually makes doing some of the phylogeny more difficult and I'm going to talk to you about some of our approaches to try and deal with that. So HIV group M is responsible for most of the epidemic, but there's HIV-1 and HIV-2. M is read to most of the diversity we see here, but just to sort of keep you in context here, it's thought there actually were probably four non-human primate to human transmissions that disseminated in people, and those respond to M, N, O, and P types as well as HIV, I'm sorry, five, and HIV-2. But I'm going to really concentrate here on the HIV type M uh, epidemic, which is responsible for, for most HIV infections worldwide. So, okay. so there are these circulating recombinant forms and unique recombinating forms. And let me just give you a little bit of an idea of how they're defined. So. These circulating common forms contain sequences that are attributed to two or more original clades. Um, recombination between viruses is actually quite frequent. And so for these to be called a circulating recombinant form, we have to pull a, scientists would have to pull and identify a sequence out of at least three epidemiologically, Im, epidemiologically unlinked people. That's the evidence that it's circulating. And otherwise, it just gets called a unique recombinant form. Um, these get serial numbers. They're usually given the letters of the clades that they are thought to have originated from. There are second order recombinants for which one of the parents is an already identified CRF. And then some of them are just called CPX for complex, basically meaning they have three and sometimes more parents that have been identified. And I'm going to come back to that a bit. I'm not really going to go through this slide entirely here, but I just want to take this to sort of emphasize the initial transmission be from primates to humans, in most cases, and certainly for him, is thought to have happened in southern Cameroon. And some of the modeling where, where, um, that has, is that actually a lot of the dissemination seems, seems to have happened from Kinshasa at least the initial dissemination. By around the 40s or the 50s, there were other dissemination points, and that's a topic of some of our research that actually I won't have time to show you today. But there may have been many strains that actually just didn't make it to Kinshasa in the first place, and that were resident in Cameroon. There also may have been strains that had traits that made them unlikely to become disseminated worldwide, and they may still exist in Cameroon.
So this process of identifying recombinants is based on a model of these disseminated viruses and where they are elsewhere in the world. And to sort of illustrate this, let me take a case in point, which I'll take Cuba as a case in point. There are approximately four, maybe five, um, HIV-1 subtypes that were introduced into Cuba. Subtype B, subtype G, there was a, as a minor subtype, subtype C, and I think um, subtype C or F19. All have been identified as having been introduced into Cuba. And when you have a limited number of subtypes, greater than one at least, you really can see the subtypes quite clearly. And there's actually a series of BG recombinants that have been found in Cuba, and it's really quite clear. The B-derived sequences actually are more closely related to Cuban B sequences than to even to other Bs, else, the geographically elsewhere, and the same for the G-derived sequences. And you can really understand how this is understood because there were a limited number of subtypes there. There was a recombination event. We have enough sequences to kind of tease that out and pull that apart quite well. And there's not a lot of uncertainty about where those sequences came from and that they're recombinants. Once you're in the sort of the cradle of it all, you have a very, very large number of sequences that have diversified even before these sort of known subtypes have actually disseminated. And we'd actually like to know more about them. And I'm going to tell you a bit about how we've identified some of them in our present sequences. So these come from these sort of um, mosaic CRFs. They're very high diversity. They're generally low prevalence. They've all been called recombinants, and some of them actually are recombinants. And they've been found primarily in rural Cameroon. And they're identified as containing segments of multiple clades, some of which, such as subtype F and subtype H, are actually around at very, very low prevalence. Also, a lot of them seem to have uh, sequences that we'll call indeterminate origin. And when you try to identify sort of a single letter clade where they come from, you, you just can't. And this is what I've already said, such as F and H, that there are some low prevalent parents. It is possible that F and H were much higher prevalence in the past, but there, have been, there are some older sequences from Cameroon and there is no evidence for that. Um, it's also expected that these recombinants should be at higher prevalence where incidence and transmission is higher. We have a much higher likelihood of having people infected with two um, completely unrelated viruses. And that happens in cities, particularly in Yaoundé and Cameroon, compared to rural areas. And although the data aren't, in that, aren't very good, I can't stand here and make a claim to you that this is or isn't true. Certainly, there's no evidence with all the sequences that we have that recombination rates are higher in, in cities like Yaoundé than they are in lower transmission rural areas. And to the extent there are data, it does make you think that maybe even the opposite is true. So all of this doesn't fit very well together for calling these recombinants. Some of them are and some of them very possibly aren't. So Marcel set to uh, do a bit more analysis for that. And the first thing he needed to do was have a manageable number of sequences to analyze, because these are full-length sequences, and not just use every sequence that's there. On the other hand, he didn't want to pick random sequences from each clade, because then you have a real risk of not actually representing the entire diversity of the clade. So for example, if you take subtype B, there, might, there are hundreds of, of full-length sequences. So he actually made a maximum likelihood tree of all the sequences, starting, for example, with subtype B, and then just picked one sequence from each branch. So he then left himself with a manageable number of sequences from each clade, trying to represent as best as possible the entire diversity of the sequences that exist. And then, of course, for a few of these clades, he just picked all the sequences because there weren't very many of them. But this is much more than people usually do when picking random sequences. You frequently will find yourself, especially if you pick two or three of them, not really taking in a representation of all the diversity of, say, subtype B or subtype A that's available in the sequences in the database. Then the next thing, he took two approaches to try and now analyze some of these very divergent sequences. I'll call them platypus sequences. You know, they're not mammals, they're not birds, they're not one of our clades. There's something sort of in between. And we think a lot of these sequences really are what I'll call platypus sequences. So 
you do your sequence alignment with sequences from just about every CRF and just about every clade, as well as some of the unique recombinant forms and some of the divergent sequences, some of which Marcel sequenced himself and some of which come from the literature. He did an RDP4 analysis on them, which is a blind, and it's actually what I'll call fully exploratory screen-free combination. It makes no assumptions about who the parents are, unlike most of the other methods to find recombinants. It actually tests every other sequence in your set to see if they might be, well, not necessarily the, the recombination parent, but, but a relative of the recombination parent. So we're looking as good as possible to try and pick out recombinant sequences and then pulls out all these minor recombination sequences because they'll, they'll, they'll make your tree worthless, basically. You can't look at relationships between pieces uh, where some of, the, some of the genomes have recombinant sequences in them. And then you take what's what I'll call basically the major parent, the longest sequence that's non-recombinant, and then look in a maximum likelihood tree and try and figure out who people are because one of the major reasons why a sequence will appear at the base of a branch at the base of the tree is because these recombinant sequences are there sort of pushing them out and not allowing you to see the relationship. So I'll give you the conclusion first, which is where I've been headed the whole time, is some of these isolates are not easily classified into existing subtypes, even after you take out the recombinant sequences. And so what he did here is he, there's, there's about 600 sequence, 600 genomes in here. So this sort of triangles all of the subtype B and, and resequences and its recombinants, where there's a recombinant who, for whom the major parent is B, the same for D, the same for C, and then there's this sort of large, more diverse A-like unit over here um, that if you draw it broadly enough includes CRF02 and CRF01. Um, but what you end up with here is some sequences like CRF13, 11, and 27, and 4. They're all called CPX, and they're called CPX because there seemed to be a lot of parents for them. And what's probably really happening is that some of these, these parental sequences for these CRFs that are not recombinant, as far as we can tell, with all of the sequences we've tried to include as possible recombination parents, still are at the base of the tree and are probably essentially their own clades. Um, there's more data about this, but I won't have time to show that to you. The second approach he used was to take that same alignment and then take each of the CRFs and divide it up into segments based on the published recombination breakpoints. And then take each of those recombinant segments, one, two, three, four, well, not one in this case, because it's mostly the LTR, but say two, two through nine in this case. And for each separate one, make a maximum likelihood tree. And for that, so try to see if this G-derived portion or so it's published actually really is G or just a more distant relative of G that's actually older. And I won't have time to go through this too much. I've picked two examples. But suffice it to say that in at least some of the cases, you will see that actually the, when you take the one segment, it actually groups separately with the identified recombinant parent, separate from, and actually only distantly related. These are related by a most recent common ancestor that's probably older than the most recent common ancestor of J in this case, or G in this case. We did see some cases of being embedded, so the envelope portion of G that's attributed to G is a recombinant sequence from G, because it's, this is inside G for contrast. And, but for many of these others, they actually treat separately. And to take CRF27, it actually appeared that for example, here, here's some 27 sequences, this is all I have time to show you, that actually all of the G sequences and all of the diversity of the hundred odd sequences of G for this region actually are embedded within the CRF27 derived segment. And that this whole tree is actually much older and that the G sequences are sort of a recent descendant of the CRF27 sequences here. So although many of these recombinants really are recombinants, Many of the sequences that have been attributed to a particular clade are not from that clade. 
and are from sequences that are older, or in one or few cases, it's actually the opposite. Because the way we picked our clades and our non-recombinant sequences was by who disseminated and caused the epidemics in, say, B for Western Europe and North America, or C for Southern Africa and for India primarily. And that's how we picked our single letter clades. But what's really happening is there actually are a lot more of them. Some of them are older, and many of them didn't disseminate. So many of these CRFs have fragments from previously uncharacterized diverging HIV-1 group M lineages. It's a, there's now a far more diverse pool of sequences circulating than our current classification system sort of suggests by the way or implies automatically just by the way its definitions are set up. Um, some uncharacterized clades actually likely predate these known pure clades and just didn't disseminate globally. In some cases, that may be because they just never made it to Kinshasa at the right time. But in some cases, there may be something about those sequences that didn't let them disseminate. And that would be very interesting to trying to piece together the early evolutionary history of HIV and why we ended up with some of the clades that we ended up with today. So without further ado, I want to thank all my collaborators, both for these projects and for the other projects we have in the lab. Um, so uh, Elisa Nemes and Judith Toymira and Joseph Focom for some of the sequences that um, we used in the, um, in the child study. Those sequences came from uh, CIRCB in Yaoundé. Um, I tell for the sequences and for the samples that Marcel has been analyzing for the last part of the last topic I told you about, about the HIV diversity. And um, Vittoria Kalitzi and Giulia Capelli also were, were a big part of the project, the children's project as well. And also, of course, all the people in my lab um, who've contributed to the conversations for this project or, or to the project themselves, proje worked on the projects themselves. And uh, without further ado, it's getting close to the end here, so I'll stop for questions. <laughs>